I'm Carla Buella. And I'm Kyle Royakers, and this is Spoke TV, your source for local weekly news produced by second-year journalism broadcast students from Conestoga College. The Immigration Minister is releasing details today on the 25,000 refugees Canada is taking in. Waterloo Region has decided to help out through the Welcome Home and Ray of Hope programs. Spoke TV's Michelle Ramos visits these organizations to learn more. Justin Trudeau recently announced that Canada will be taking in 25,000 refugees by January 2016, 10,000 of whom will be living in Ontario and 1,150 who will make a home in the Waterloo region. Welcome Home is an organization that helps support refugees getting settled in the Tri-Cities by providing food, clothing, activities and a place to live. Last year, however, Welcome Home's refugee residence was closed, leaving Welcome Home essentially homeless. But this October, Ray of Hope took them under their wing, becoming their parent organization, providing financial support and a building to operate out of. Sharon Schmidt, Welcome Home's organizer, talks about what the program needs in order to handle this year's 250% increase in refugee cases. So financial donations would be the very best first thing that people can do. And then we'll be looking to do training sessions to, to connect Canadians with these new arrivals so that they've got a Canadian friend who can help them through some of these challenges. A building to operate out of and financial support through donations to Welcome Home is not the only assistance Ray of Hope is providing to refugees. Ray of Hope has its own services to help newcomers to the country. Harry White, CEO of Ray of Hope in Kitchener, talks about what services they offer to the public and how they will benefit those new to the country. Through our community center and the food hamper program, we have a number of refugee youth that end up in the justice system because of the challenges. Uh, that they faced in their lives and we thought you know it, it, we can't say no to this we really need to uh, just ad adopt welcome home you can donate to the ray of hope or welcome home financially or through giving clothing and food for spoke tv i'm michelle ramos kitchener go train station is expanding to shirley avenue where a new station is being built 20 go buses and four trains will be held there many local residents are happy about the expanded service in the region Spoke TV's Lindsay Griesbach has the story. More than 10,000 people commute from Kitchener to the GTA every day, which has led to construction of a new $16 million GO Train layover station on Shirley Street in Kitchener. The new station will be able to house four trains and several GO buses overnight, while the current station, the one here at the corner of Victoria and Weber Street West, can only hold two. This means four trains will be leaving every morning from Kitchener to Toronto and four coming back into the city at night. Local resident Cherie Booth used to live in Hamilton and commuted daily by GO train to her job in Oakville. And I found it to be extremely convenient. I never had to worry about traffic. I never had to worry about the weather. I didn't have to worry about parking. And I think that if GO Transit increases their train service to Kitchener, that it would be very beneficial for a lot of people who commute daily. But it isn't all smooth sailing. There are still no morning trains from Toronto to Kitchener or evening trains from Kitchener to Toronto. Another obstacle, quite literally, is a 30 kilometer line of track between Georgetown and Brampton, owned by Canadian National Railway. They're hesitant to have passenger trains take up time on this track, which they use as a direct line to carry freight. A group of engineers, planners and policy people are discussing the matter now and Kitchener Centre MPP Diane Verniel tells Spoke TV about what else is being done to resolve the issue. We've appointed David Colonet to be our special advisor to look at high speed rail and he used to be a federal minister of transportation in Canada so I think he's going to be a very good negotiator for us. Uh, we also have a new federal partner in Ottawa. During the election campaign Justin Trudeau campaigned in our area and talked about his commitment to seeing improved service for GO trains. Verniel hopes to have the new layover station complete by April of next year and for two-way all-day GO trains to be a reality by 2025. For Spoke TV, I'm Lindsay Griesbach. It's time for a visit to Kitchener's least favorite roundabout, where in 2014 there were 107 collisions, roughly one every three and a half days. Matt Howell speaks with residents about the problems it has continued to cause. The roundabout located at Homer Watson and Block Line has been the site of a lot of incidents since it opened four years ago. There has been over 200 accidents at the roundabout, with over 100 of those coming in 2014. There are many factors that may explain all the problems that have arisen here. Driver uncertainty, a speed limit change, 
St. Mary's High School being nearby, detours, and a busy Tim Hortons all could be possible explanations for the turmoil here. Pedestrian walkways play a big part as well. Some residents, including Jennifer Linlau, have major concerns about safety when trying to get across the roundabout. Um, this is the most horrible roundabout I've ever been in my whole life. Um, I walk, I don't drive, so I work actually at the Tim Hortons. Every day is a battle. I have to point at the sign, usually do a little dance before someone will stop. Um, I also have a daughter and I don't even bring her this way um, because it's horrible. Even working in the Timmies, every day there's a, some type of fender bender, there's some type of accident um, with all the kids. It's just horrible I'm watching it here all day. So I'm standing here in the center of the roundabout at Homer Watson and Block Line. Some consider this to be the worst roundabout in the Tri-Cities. Even with all the accidents and collisions that have taken place here, the city is still planning on putting two more roundabouts in the area. Drivers who travel this route on a daily basis know the troubles this roundabout causes. And some of them, like Paul Kelly, think driver education might be the biggest issue. It is a good idea if people understand what to do with a roundabout. And I think that's what it is actually. I think you need more education about roundabouts. Um, I read the student handbook, which says, okay, when you're exiting the roundabout, you signal. People here think, oh, well, I'm entering the roundabout. I should signal to enter. I should signal to change lanes. It's all about education. That's my big thing, and that's what really grinds my gears. For Spoke TV, I'm Matt Howell. When it comes down to cancer care, every province across the nation seems to do things a little differently. Certain surgeries are extremely risky, and having a standard practice may increase people's odds of survival. Living in Ontario has been found to increase your odds of surviving high-risk surgical cancer operations. A recent article by the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer shows that Ontario has one of the most evidence-based and successful approaches to cancer care. Findings show huge variations in survivability across the country, and the article by the CPAC stresses the benefits of standardizing the care system. The article provides a graph organized by high-risk cancer types, including the liver, lungs, and ovaries, and lists the total deaths against preventable deaths. The CPAC hopes that cancer care can be improved and lives saved by the actions they suggest. Our region is a great place to be a post-secondary student. Wilfrid Laurier University has now joined the University of Waterloo and the University of Guelph as one of the top 10 universities in Canada. Spoke TV's Natalie McCallum has more. McLean's Magazine released their rankings last month for the universities across the country. The University of Waterloo was ranked second, jumping one spot since last year. But the big surprise was Wilfrid Laurier University, who jumped three spots and found themselves in the top 10. It's common for the University of Waterloo to have a spot in the top 10 universities within the country. But for Wilfrid Laurier University, this is a first, and it just goes to show that their hard work is actually paying off. Academic and Provost Vice President at Laurier, Deborah McLatchy, doesn't think this was something Laurier was trying to achieve. The fact that they've made it onto the list just goes to show they're making a difference for their students. I think part of uh, what Laurier has done is really focused on what we think are our priorities and our mission. And so where we did very well in the subcategories includes such areas as uh, student success and uh, fac faculty awards. So really focusing on the experience that students have here at Laurier. McLean's rankings are determined by combining five indicators students, faculty, resources, student support, and reputation. Steph Weatherald, a Laurier student, thinks that this just makes students appreciate their school and its success. For current students, I don't think it makes that much of a difference, just because in general, I think um, all of the students here are really proud to be Golden Hawks, and it's just that community that we have around us. For prospective students, it might change something for them, but for the current students right now, I think it's just a ranking that like we can be proud of but not anything that really changes how we feel about our school. For current and future students alike this ranking gives a clear starting point in deciding which school to choose and hopefully for schools in this region they continue rising to the top of the list. For Spoke TV I'm Natalie McCallum. There's a big difference between a living wage and the minimum wage and not only in dollars. Alex Spears visited Cambridge the first municipality in Ontario to become a living wage employer. Here's what he found. Last week, Cambridge became the first municipality in Ontario to be assigned living wage employer. The City Council voted 6 to 1 for the policy. Living wage, however, is not the same as minimum wage. Living wage reflects what a family needs to earn based on the cost of living in a specific community. 
According to Councillor Pam Wolf, there are still many advantages to paying employees a living wage. As some of the advantages to um, having a living wage are health, uh, how much you earn is one of the greatest determinants of your health, research has shown. So when people earn a living wage, they're healthier. According to the Waterloo record, at this stage, the Cambridge Councillor's decision is mostly symbolic. They have mandated that all full-time city employees are entitled to a 16.05 an hour living wage, but in practical terms, those employees are already receiving that wage level or more. In terms of being a good employee, um, there's less absenteeism, there's uh, less turnover, uh, an employer doesn't have to retrain and rehire, which is expensive and uh, productivity increases. The living wage is based on a family of four with two adults working 37 and a half hours a week. It does not include, however, things like retirement savings, debt repayment, or home ownership. Living wage is meant to include expenses such as food, clothing, shelter, childcare, transportation, medical expenses, recreation, and a modest vacation. For Spoke TV, I'm Alex Spears. Thanks, Alex. Mr. and Mrs. Claus visited Cambridge last Saturday for the annual Christmas parade. The streets were filled with cheer, children, and Christmas spirit as the big guy made his way through the town. It's the most wonderful time of the year again in Cambridge. Hespeller Road was buzzing with energy as friends and family gathered to watch the Santa Claus parade. Grand River Transit and even Mayor Doug Craig joined the fun. Cambridge is one of the only parades to have both Santa and Mrs. Claus visit. Mrs. Claus is always by his side. They are the ultimate team when it comes to Christmas. It's a big couple of months for video game releases. Black Ops 3 on November 6th, Fallout 4 two weeks ago, and now Star Wars Battlefront, the first game of its series in about 10 years. Caleb Herbison found out why fans are so excited to play Battlefront at the midnight release. This one definitely has more dedicated fans. I mean, this guy's over here in lightsabers and cloaks and stuff, so. And that's exactly what sets the Star Wars Battlefront Midnight release apart from every other video game, the fans' dedication. Star Wars originally hit the big screens back in 1977 and later released five more titles in the saga. Now in 2015 comes the release of Star Wars Battlefront, the third title in the video game series. The night of a game launch, select stores open up at midnight for the most diehard fans to get their copy before anyone else. Many were lined up on release night and shared why they feel so strongly about this series. Because I love Star Wars ever since I was a child and uh, seeing the graphics through the beta and through the trailers, I'm like, they finally did a game. They gave like homage to the source material, so I'm excited. Yeah. With four previous games, the most recent coming out in 2009, Star Wars seems to be a hit regardless of if it's a video game or if it's on the big screen. David Rendall, who has a master's in video game history, had this to say about the new Star Wars game. The developer is really famous for the Battlefield series and they're known for just like these insane multiplayer matches where like insanity just occurs. So you see some of the screenshots and like videos from Battlefront and you see somebody controlling Luke Skywalker using force push on a stormtrooper and then an X-Wing just flying into him and exploding. It's just insanity which I'm really excited for for just the mayhem that's involved with it. So I think that's part of the reason that Battlefront has got people really excited. And with a new movie slated to release on December 18th, it will be a few action-packed months for Star Wars fans. For Spoke TV, I'm Caleb Herbison. May the force be with us. Thanks, Caleb. Hockey is such a big winter sport in Canada, and the Waterloo Warriors take time out of their busy schedule to share their skills with young girls who want to learn the game. Megan Spotswoods has more on the local girls' team, the Rookie Ravens. Falling down and learning how to get back up is only one of the skills that the Rookie Ravens hockey program teaches to young girls. And who is there to pick them up? The University of Waterloo men's hockey team. Rookie Ravens is a program designed for young girls ages 5 to 7. It teaches them the fundamentals of hockey with the main goal being fun. The program provides a safe environment for young girls to learn and develop their hockey skills. Most girls continue on to other levels when Rookie Ravens is over. The University of Waterloo men's hockey team has been volunteering with Rookie Ravens for four years now, helping them learn the basics such as stick handling, passing, shooting and skating. 
Brian Bork, University of Waterloo men's hockey head coach and also coach of the Bantam AA Ravens hockey team, feels like the guys on the team and rookie Ravens both benefit off of each other. We're also, you know, trying to connect with the kids. We we talk to our instructors like, oh, that's a big part of it. We want the girls to have fun and want to come back and work hard. So they talk about working hard and giving your best and, and you know, enjoying each other and celebrating goals for everyone and just trying to, to try to build the, the whole side of it, if you will. University of Waterloo men's hockey player Mitch Elliott feels like this is a great learning experience for not only himself but for his team. Uh, well, it's, it's amazing to me to see this many girls involved in, in hockey. Um, like when I was growing up, it, there wasn't this much involvement and, um, you know, it's amazing to see the way the game is growing and, uh, you know, I, it really makes me feel good to be a part of that. Lisa Hutzflout says that her daughter Danica enjoys the social interaction between the university team and the girls. They've created a really fun and safe environment where Danica feels challenged um, but not intimidated to try new things. Waterloo Ravens thrives on being for the kids, for the game, for the fun of it. For Spoke TV, I'm Megan Spotswood. That's all we have for you this week. For Spoke TV from Conestoga College, I'm Carla Buella. And I'm Kyle Royakers. For more news and information, visit spoketv.ca. So how's life in